so welcome to the uh, Horasis Global <clears throat> Meeting panel on art, COVID-19, and the future. Uh, I'm the session moderator, Richard Vine, senior editor at Art in America magazine in New York. Um, our participants today include, uh, at this point, three artists. We were supposed to have four. Uh, and we also were supposed to have an independent curator who may be joining us uh, if she resolves her technical glitches. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> the people participating have various ties all over the world, uh, including to Korea, South Africa, Nigeria, Great Britain, and the United States. And uh, as we go along, I want to introduce each of them. They'll make it a brief personal presentation uh, dealing with their own work and this topic. Uh, and then we'll have a discussion both among ourselves and hopefully with uh, participants who will send in, please, your comments and queries to the chat room. <clears throat> so I thought that <clears throat> given the cultural mix of our panel, it's only natural to, to look at this topic <clears throat> both in terms of cultural specificity and from a globalist perspective. <clears throat> um, you know, in my own case, uh, Art in America, which has been publishing for over 100 years, since 1913, um, long ago decided to ignore its sort of nationalistic title and instead <clears throat> examine work made and shown all over the world. Um, for example, my own quasi-specialty for the past two decades has been contemporary art in China, about which I wrote a, a book called New China, New Art, <clears throat> which came out in 2008 and was in edition in 2011. Um, interesting, when I first went to China, um, it was for the occasion of the Shanghai Biennale in the year 2000, where I gave a talk called uh, Welcome to the Monoculture, which was based on what at the time seemed this self-evident notion that we were entering an era of full global integration. Uh, you know, the nations would accelerate their myriad uh, interconnections uh, in business and in politics and media, communications and, yes, culture and art. Um, needless to say, things didn't go that smoothly. <laughs> uh, in 2007, 2008, we experienced the great global financial crisis, <clears throat> followed by, if not precipitated by, <clears throat> or, or if not precipitated, um, a resurgence of old fashioned nationalism, ethnocentrism racism, religious fanaticism, and uh, this so-called uh, popularism, <clears throat> all of which left me these sort of globalist dream and deferred, let us say. And then in 2019, beginning 2020, came the pandemic. <clears throat> now, whether that bi biological disaster will prove in geocultural terms to be profoundly divisive or profoundly unifying remains to be seen. Um, the answer will be dependent uh, not only on you know, deliberate policies instituted by businesses, governments, and cultural institutions, but also by you know, the aggregate actions of some 7.8 billion people who live on this earth, <clears throat> a very small percentage of whom are engaged in this rather strange endeavor we call art. <clears throat> now, uh, creative people like our panelists, the legacy of the modern avant-garde is really a two-edged sword. Um, individually, Experimental artists have always striven to meld art and life. Yet, as a subculture, the art world itself operates as a realm apart, 
uh, its own taste, its own social mores, <clears throat> where artists are encouraged to critique mainstream society uh, from a separateness. So I wonder, you know, given this, <clears throat> what does art and, and what does artists have to offer to our local communities and to the wider world? So I've asked each of the panelists uh, to consider this question in light of their own art making. So uh, first up, we will now have Songmin An, uh, painter and multimedia artist. Songmin was born in Seoul, Korea, now lives in New York, <clears throat> has exhibited at such venues as the National Museum of Modern and Contemporary Art in Seoul and the Hudson River Museum in upstate New York. And she is represented by galleries in both New York City and Seoul. I thought Alexandra was going first, um, but I can oh, sorry. go first. You are right, but uh, go ahead. I can go ahead. And I'm going to share my screen. Okay, um, I have background as both Asian traditional painter and contemporary artist. And um, what I've been trying to do is incorporating two different techniques and two different cultures and aesthetics to challenge the traditionalism and push the boundaries of our um, perception so that we can create new uh, conversations from there. So in upper Dijak series, one on the left, I present mountain, mountain formed as primordial nature that provokes excitement and spiritual awakening. I also raise questions about the relationship between food, nature, and people. No rules are for me, the visual, visually pleasing in their um, natural flow and connection with water in more poetic way. They are also significant um, Asian beasts as well. And I chose the background color intuitively to evoke the emotions that I want my audiences to feel while encountering each painting, such as joy, mystery, or passion. And in evolutionary impulse on the right, but the mountain represents my own impulsive motivation, um, which can represent in, um, passion or provocation or defiance. The voyage into hyper dimension is painting installation where I incorporated technology for innovative presentation of two dimensional paintings. I added elements of time by using UV light, dimming lighter and darker every 20 seconds, which was programmed by computer software called Arduino. As a result, I exaggerated contrast between luminous fluorescent paint and Asian traditional matte paint, um, creating a surrealistic atmosphere and interesting narratives in there. This work is more about openness, and interconnectedness of two different worlds with two different perspectives. And next one is the, again um, is the uh, this is the public project which was my direct response to the pandemic. As an eye-catching visual image with decorated text, I want to give constant and beautiful assurance to my audiences that um, we will rise again from the battleground and claim a new future again after all the devastation that we went through and still are going through. Beginning from the original painting on the left, I proposed the community murals from which I got some grant to realize the project. And I keep trying to expand this project in multiple venues in um, both indoors and outdoors. Again, is also hybrid letter painting where I used cross-cultural element 
the element to design them. For example, Korean letters um, were stylized with Western ornamentation and English letters were decorated with um, Asian motivations such as a dragon and cloud pattern. So I expanded this concept to different international languages such as Spanish and Chinese as seen on the right image to reach out to diverse communities um, in US and also globally. Okay, I think uh -huh. that was. All right, thank you. Yeah, Our next, you. Um, <laughs> it's a sort of bold move um, on the part of contemporary artists to uh, attempt to revivify or uh, use in various ways traditional forms uh, uh, because you know such work can be easily misread and uh, I think that's um, part of the bravery here is um, that it, it reflects the situation we're all facing which is that post pandemic we're all going to be thinking about what is useful in the past, what do we want to bring forward and, and what do we want to jettison or leave behind as we enter this new post-pandemic world. Uh, hi, Sunny has now joined us. Hi, Sunny. Hi. Hi, everyone. Hi. Sunny. She's shown, known as Sunny, uh, an independent curator. Um, so you missed Song Min's presentation, but never fear. We're moving now to Alexandra Sveratos. Uh, born in Kenya, Alexandra has had over 40 solo shows worldwide. She's also a wildlife uh, conservationist who often paints and sketches in national parks and outreach zones in Africa, South America, and elsewhere. Alexandra. Hi, everyone. Yes, as you see behind me, that's my love is the African wildlife. Um, I grew up in Africa, so I grew up with the, the amazingness around me of the animals and the sparkles of the soil and the glistening of the, the, the rain on the, on the savanna. So I do paint in a very bling way with, with glitter. Um, it, I do also work with a lot of outreach um, schools in Africa with a lot of NGOs and with I volunteer work um, so I go out as far as northern Kenya with the Kips in the Kipsing area with the Samburu tribe and the Maasai tribe. Um, this here is an actual elephant. This is done in pure gold leaf, 22 karat gold leaf. In fact, it's owned by James Cameron, that one. And um, I'm actually also working with the soil there of Savo and a lot of glitter. I mean, in the soils in the um, parks, they have something called mica, which is a mineral. And it shines and glistens, and I kind of replicate that feeling of the wild into the art. So um, anyway, so I work with a lot of culturally cultural people that are far away in the outreach zones of Africa. I've worked with the Sambu tribe and the, the Maasai tribe um, with a charity called uh, Born to Fly Charity dot org. Um, they are opening schools in very far outreach areas of Kenya to stop poaching. So basically to teach people another career or to teach them how to make money and not be lured in by the poaching bucks that are offered to them. So they're usually in troubled zones where there is a lot of poaching of elephants. Um, I also work with Leopard Dog Foundation, which is working on animal-human conflict in Kenya. Um, and there we build the electric fences. We make animal animal corridors and well we do a lot of work with beehives on the edges of the fences the elephants don't like the bees and yet it also gives a job and a way to make money for the people there so i do a lot of work with outreach with like little schools all over the place and i love working with murals i feel that they bring the communities together um, i have a method of teaching the kids how to work on the murals so they do it all and i think it leaves a really powerful message i think with artists we have this magic at our fingertips you know we can we can really use it to bring people together especially in this COVID part post-covid era which hopefully we're going to um i just feel that we can use our 
creativity and our vision to go into the future, bringing together these different cultures and bringing together people to in far outreach areas I will be going. Um, they've all been forgotten through COVID. A lot of our funding has stopped and we haven't been able to get to these areas because we've been in lockdowns. Um, so a lot of that has stopped right now. So my next step will be to go back out there and, and be connecting with the cultural aspect of things again. Um, I, I also had a residency in South America, in the Peruvian Amazon. That's been moved to next year because as we see, Peru is going through a lot of trouble at the moment with COVID. So there's a lot of work to be done, I think, by artists of actually patching together these crevices that have appeared, the separateness that has appeared through COVID. And I think at our fingertips, we've got a way to do that, an amazing way to bring cultures together and bring people together and bring back that personal aspect of life again. Um, that's me there with the sample and in Kipsing. That's the painting behind me. That's off to Mykonos and Paros shows soon. And um, what else do I have to say? That's probably all. <laughs> I'm sure I'll think of lots of other things soon. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you for coming around. So uh, next up we have <clears throat> Beth Diane Armstrong. Uh, Beth is a South African steel sculptor and multimedia artist who has four large-scale public pictures currently in place. Uh, these include a 7.5 meter flag in the Netherlands and uh, the 10-ton page uh, at the National English Literary Museum in South Africa. So Beth? Thank you. In January 2020, a month before the pandemic broke major news, I submitted a sculpture proposal called Sphere to the Highline 3rd and 4th Plinth in New York. I was proposing an imposing stainless steel globular form, 5 meters or 16 foot in diameter. Sphere would have had a mirror finish like these sculptures that you see, these previous sculptures of mine. You just need to imagine the mirror finish and the model that I have made. This video gives a sense of three-dimensionality. Sphere has a chaotic interior that holds still and contains, and an exterior mirror finish dot-dash pattern that both absorbs and reflects, taking in and echoing back impartially whatever is surrounding it. As the months wore on waiting to hear about the Highline second round, of which I didn't get in in the end, I could not help but appreciate this sphere as an uncanny harbinger of sorts. In my sadder omen, I saw a monumental ode to a ghastly virus, and on the lighter side, a very fragmented form, yes, but still a strong and reflective universal symbol of ultimate unity. I interpreted the dots and dashes as Morse code, trade winds, disconnected flight paths, and isolated states and countries. In the interlock of Sphere's core, I saw all the new forms of communication expanding worldwide, a simultaneously fragmenting and connecting world. The interior of Sphere is locked in, and the mirror just keeps absorbing and reflecting, undiscerning and forgiving. I draw an analogy to the witness in South Africa. COVID is a great leveler. When people feel trapped and COVID is impartial, it doesn't care who you are. Post-COVID, COVID is just a fantasy for some countries. Or I should clarify, I think in some spaces and psyches, there is only the now and living in the next moment. In South Africa, we've just entered our third wave. Our largest government hospital in Kaateng burned and has been closed for the last two months. Two other government hospitals have water shortages and other hospitals are full. I think there is especially no post-COVID for the devastation it has and will leave on the human psyche and subsequent mental health issues. These issues are likely to be extensive, possibly taking years to unpack, study and resolve. 
We have a shared global trauma, that of separation and isolation. We've been made to be like mirrors, to be like vessels of absorption and reflection, having to absorb so much more psychologically and emotionally than perhaps speed of processing allows, and with so much time alone, so much self-reflection. COVID has been a time of change for me personally. In 2018, some unusual drawings emerged for me, such as these. Although the moment passed quickly, the spontaneity is opening up in me again. There is developing a zero tolerance for pain in my work. Much of my previous work required hours, weeks, months of monotonous, repetitive, physically and psychologically painful work, trying to achieve perfection, often to the detriment of my health. I'm finding more than ever I need to stay in the joy zone. With COVID, things are stressful, volatile, and deeply painful. I think my psyche is responding to that energetically. I just cannot contribute to the situation for myself and for society at large. Artists do often consciously create society, but sometimes they're simply processing their own internal matter and relationship to the world, almost as a means of survival. Most of my work is made in this manner. I don't believe we really know what we're processing with COVID. We're too deep in it, not sure what side of the mirror we're on. The sphere is fragmented. Luckily, there are those artists arting, and if other people can find inspiration, reassurance, and comfort in those artists that are able to create something in helping to process the zeitgeist of this time, then that will really help move us all along. We really need help, and the public is asking for it. Thanks. Thank you, Beth. Very moving presentation. <coughs> and um, come back to a couple of points later uh, that you raised there. I think it's very important for those of us living in richer mm -hmm. countries to remember that the pandemic is very much a present tense situation um, that you know, large areas of the world uh, are still very much in the midst of this. You know, not yet passing out of it. Um, and secondly, as, as Beth noted, that the, the pandemic is experienced both externally, socially, and you know, its effect on <clears throat> yeah, how we show our art or where we go to eat, et cetera. But it's also experienced internally you know, in various ways by various people. And that's very important to keep in mind. Uh, but we need to move on now to um, Shishakun, known as Sunny. <laughs> um, Sunny is a Chinese-born independent curator and art appraiser who spent 15 years studying and working in the West, where she earned a BA in art history and mass communication and an MA in art business. In 2013, she founded Arts Rouge International in Shanghai, which specializes in curating temporary public art projects in innovative spaces. Sunny? Thank you, Richard. Hi, um, my name is Sunny Cho, and um, this is um, uh, it's my own exactly. to be here um, to share my experience with you. And um, so uh, back in 2013, and I went back to China um, to set up my practice and company, Arts Rouge International. Um, so I always ask myself this fundamental question, what, why we are working in the arts and in what, um, what kind of experience people they, you know, they would encounter when they see a piece of art. And then, because I was, I did a lot of field trips and, um, um, during my college years. And then that was the, this kind of transcendental moment I had for myself. Um, when you really encounter this, this moment of a sublime and a beauty. Um, so I decided to, to really, um, provide this kind of experience for the public. So that's why I am trying to do a lot of like innovative um, projects in the public space. Because in China currently, we, our audience, let's say, they don't really have 
hundreds of years of background of studying contemporary art or art. Like, let's say, I mean, in hundreds of years ago, of course, we had this traditional of uh, tradition of appreciation of artworks in Chinese calligraphy and Chinese paintings. Um, but when the West bringing this contemporary art um, concepts and, and this conceptual art and all that you know, notions in chi uh, into China. And, um, and I was asking myself, like, what I can do to provide um, an experience for the mass um, public. So that's why I was very focusing on uh, doing this public art programs and which that does not really you know, require people to have like specific art education or contemporary art education. And then they would be able to walk in as they encounter in on the street or somewhere for the temporary art installations. So, um, and I really try to bring this um, to people and then let them really experience this, this artistic moment for them for their lives um and of course we're talking about the COVID situation and um i was actually stuck in new york um last year for the entire year and i was here for um, a project uh, but at the same time i think COVID has a lot um given to us to to re in introspect like to ask ourselves like exactly uh, what we are here for. And, and then, you know, a lot of fundamental questions for artists and art critiques or like we, you know, art curators. Um, so in that way, I think um, people, um, in, there are so many people in different aspects of, of in, let's say, our business, and this is staggering um, auction, you know, um, investments and records and all that kind of thing. And But I think it's really not the essence of why we're working in the art, I mean, at least for myself. So I think this, this COVID situation really, you know, this lockdown and, and give us a lot of time to to think about all those essential questions and uh, i had a lot of artists they came to me saying wow this is the best time they had actually in um for all those years because there's no dinners there's no art events and art fairs so they could really enjoy themselves like the relationship with the art and the you know that kind of connection so i think that's that's very very important did you have a couple of projects you wanted to show us here? Uh, yes, so sure. So this the, on the screen right now, this project, um, it's um, it, it is actually because of this COVID, and I was stuck in here uh, in in New York, and a friend of mine and I, we just we found the you know um, this artist I have been adoring for very long time and um um so her work has this the spiritual purity and power in her work and so um we said okay well maybe this COVID time really provide us th with this opportunity to curate this show and um and then maybe also because of COVID, and then the museum it was not completely booked and we had this opportunity to present this show. It's called Transcending Fields. Um, and this exhibition has like 19 rooms, 19 separate gallery rooms. And, and I, in terms of like, I curated in a way that people, they would pretty much buy this specific notion that I believe art should have this very um, intimate, energy and a very intimate relationship with with every single one of the viewers so um that's why we built this room like room by room and um and this transcending fields by itself um so this is a project yes i'm not sorry uh in interest of time we need to wrap yes, yes. Uh, and you haven't mentioned the name of the artist <laughs> the artist uh yes uh, Ruth Hardinger, and she is a great, great artist. And she, th this is like um, 
50 years of work she has been in New York and, and in different countries. Um, so I think this, I mean, if any of you are in New York or come to New York recently and welcome to this show. And this is um, the, this very recent project. And um, in, um, probably, yes. So the Real Fiction Cinema is a project um, Richard also experienced. And um, it's set up in, in New York, I mean, in, uh, in China. Shanghai and also in Guangdong, Dongguan city, and it's um, it's been um, how can I say like it's been two cities, and we're trying to tour the entire China, and this is a public intervention in the public space, and people they can freely walk in; it's completely free, and then they just you know um, in the this box. It's, 12 meters by five meters. And then instead of this projecting uh, projecting screen, it's completely cut out. So people, they're, they're sitting inside, they're exactly walking what exactly outside. So this is a conceptual artwork by um, Joop Kollewein. Um, he's a Netherlands artist. Um, he's also one of the artists, I think he has this, um, um, very uh, interesting way how he can bring out this this core value of art in a very simple way. Great. Yeah. I'm going to have to uh, cut you off there and move okay. on. Sure, <laughs> sure. Absolutely. Wow, we, got, we still have. So, Kari Douglas Camp, TV. <laughs> uh, so, Kari, who was born in Nigeria and now lives in London, has re represented both Britain and Nigeria in national and international exhibitions. She has had over 40 solo shows in venues such as the Smithsonian National Museum of African Art in Washington, D.C., and the Museum of Mankind in London. So, so Clary? Hi. Hi. Um, well, shaping, shaping the future after COVID. <laughs> Um, do you think I can have an image up? Yes, my first image would be great. Um, yes, um, I, I made this just before the pandemic and I was invited to uh, Japan to make a piece about journeys. And my work up to the pandemic had um, delved into um, sort of environmental concerns. So, um, I wanted to illustrate our journey so far, uh, our journey with oil, because I, I come from a part of Nigeria where oil has been extracted for the last um, 35 years or so and extracted badly. So it's in my psyche to talk about it all the time just because um, the environment has been ruined. Anyway, the thing about um, this piece of work is that it was... Um, actually COVID sensitive in that no one could get near it. Um, it was um, on train tracks in the middle of a, a, a railway station, a busy railway station where people commuted into Tokyo. And um, so there are oil barrels and then um, this peculiar red car and, and um, a sort of a bamboo illustrated environment that it's supposed to be running through. But it was strange to see it in this busy station um, being viewed by people in trains and um, around the platform. My next image, please. Okay, when COVID struck, I managed to get back to London um, and I was terrified. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, I've never felt so sort of um, useless in my life. Um, and I, I don't know, I went a little bit crazy and, um, I started making furniture because I decided that that was more useful than making any kind of thinking art. Ah, so I'm in love with, um, a South African plant, which is an agapanthus to me. So I copied this plant with the material that I had in this in the studio and made about three or four tables and I was able to put a glass top on it but I was using material that was extremely thick it was um, four mil thick steel 
and the work was really physical and absorbing. And after I'd spent time in the studio, all I could do was lie down and say, it served lockdown very well. So these are my lockdown tables. Next slide, please. Um, so since we sort of got used to this new normal, I decided to uh, look at myself a little bit more. And um, you know, I, I've had a long time working now, nearly sort of 35 years. And um, I just wanted to comment on my identity. I just, cause, just because I guess at this time we all got quite lost. And um, I decided to do work about masquerade and um, John Canoe which is connected with the Caribbean and it's connected with slavery and colonialism and um, and being British, because I am Nigerian British. And um, so I, I was studying these masqueraders and realizing that um, carnival events is another kind of platform um, for viewing artwork. And it's artwork that is has a kind of sympathetic element globally because we've always had sort of ephemeral art that was like a performance, you know, people coming out and parading was a form of art and not being able to go into galleries and museums, I was trying to sort of think slightly out of the box and referring to the um, piece that I'd made in Japan that was untouchable but viewable and public art. So what I'd like to do is is make these carnival figures and put them on a on a float of some kind. And because in London the streets have been um, um, closed off to stop pollution and closed off because I don't know why they're trying to control us here in a, a peculiar way. They have um, almost turned areas into little villages, little packages. So you feel if you know, you want to um, somehow reach out to the community and have a conversation. And um, COVID has almost given me a platform for this conversation because I, I want to make a self-contained um, float um, with these figures having a conversation about identity. And that's where I am at now. Wonderful. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I think, I think we don't have very much time left. But, um, um, I was particularly struck by uh, that image of the real life cinema that someone showed earlier, because it, it seemed to me that that was a perfect sort of physical metaphor for what art does. I mean, you create this special environment, whether it's the art world or the art studio or the art work itself, this frame through which you then look out into the world and in the case of the real art cinema, um, the work of art is the world itself. Uh, it's transformed into a movie before your eyes, and yet it's very much the flesh and blood world that we all live in. Um, and um, I don't know if that's related in any way, Alexandra, to this strange notion of yours I've, I've heard somewhere about nature is bling that, that, that goes against all my instincts uh, because you know we always think of nature and artifice as being uh conceptual contraries what can you tell us about that nature is so bling <laughs> because? Um, i think you know it's the way you see every we all see things through different eyes and i've always seen things through very happy eyes and I go into the wild and and it really does sparkle everything sparkles and but as I said before there's a mica there's a mineral in the soil and as you drive through the bush and going over this soil is sparkling you know it's constantly sparkling and I, I like to replicate that in my paintings and just the glistening pelts of the animals I mean you, even in the sea with the phosphorescence of the you know, plankton, phosphorescence, the whole of nature is just bling. But it depends if you see that, you know, everyone sees different things. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, well, Beth takes a uh, somewhat contrary approach. I mean, you're very much a putter in her. <laughs> uh, <laughs> a lot of visual stimuli uh, in your works. Uh, 
whereas Beth uh, seems to work to uh, toward uh, more essence and elimination of a lot in order to come down to a specific statement. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, mine is really just there. It says yeah. it just <laughs> flashing. It says it all in the there. Yeah. Uh, and in the few minutes we have left, I just want to address that notion of the future a little bit. Um, um, I know we all had some version of the ex experience. Um, Song Min had a rather dramatic one. Uh, I know that she had a very large, very beautiful show completely installed in a cultural institution here in New York, uh, virtually on the day that the city went into lockdown. Um, and of course, a lot of artists around the world experienced this kind of thing, and a lot of people in their everyday lives. Um, but I wonder, Song Min, if you could say something about this new project of yours in this sense of again and, and going on. <laughs> Yes, as he mentioned, um, that was one of the most ambitious shows that I uh, prepared for three years. And then on the day they announced the lockdown, um, that was my opening day. And um, well, it like a pandemic, but the thing is, um, the whole pandemic and the social isolation was really double-edged sword for me. That whole this experience was, I was devastated and depressed um but that was one emotion that i had um but at the same time on the other hand i uh, when i put those emotions aside and also when i look at myself and then the world from different point of view and also when i um was able to um try to come the crisis into new opportunities and when i really tried to put all those th put things together and try to create something new for myself then um finally i was able to um create something new that i wasn't really imagining before that one of those are again project that is um really meaningful that was one of the first community project that i created and um uh, and through those uh, experience, I was able to transfer that negative impact into a piece of contemplation and beauty, something positive that I can contribute to the community, which came from some negative impact. So I think that in that in terms of that, it was really valuable experience for yeah. me. And I think it's significant that you, you bridge that experience by by looking to outward, by looking to the community. You know, sort of, in some ways, healing your own trauma by addressing the world at large and uh, taking into account that we had all suffered through this um, crisis in in various ways and to various degrees, and uh, and so making a quick mural and a public work of art that uh, hopefully will encourage us all. Um, yeah. So um, we have just one minute left, which I think is just time to thank you all. <laughs> Someone has a, a great parting shot. Um, <laughs> well, I think it was great to see um, Dong Min's, I hope I've said your name right, mural. I really loved it. And I just think murals are such a powerful way for us to express and to combine working with lots of people and to bring people together in post-COVID. It's a way for mindful education and positive imprinting. And I think it's a really powerful way because they can be so huge and it's such an imprinting, you know, you're looking at this huge thing. It's just so powerful. I find murals are amazing to, to bring people together. Thank you. Thank you all very much. I've gotten the signal that our official time is up. So uh, we will stop streaming. Thank you all so very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.